Okay, well, I'll call the meeting to order the Wareham Finance Committee. Today is Wednesday, the July 22nd, it is 6.30 p.m. And I'll call the roll, Stuart. Joe. Here. David. Here. Jerry. Here. Okay, we have a quorum of six. And the principal evening we have the principal subject we have this evening is the school committee. And the primary reason is that uh, Thursday prior to town meeting is when the school committee actually voted on their uh, their budget. So we as a committee never had an opportunity to review it. And I thought, well, we should considering the uh, difference that uh, the committee has had to go through to A, to get through the past fiscal year and B, prepare and implement the current fiscal year. So initially, um, in Joyce, in reviewing the year end, how do you feel your department survived? Um, I think that a lot of people worked very hard to, to end the school year. Um, there were savings in some areas, but you know, unexpected expenses in other areas. Um, but financially, I think we ended the year well. Very good. Does anyone have any questions about the last fiscal year, how they completed it? What, was it on budget? Um, Dr. Shaver Hood can, can confirm, but yes. Okay. Did you have any savings in particular accounts where you use those monies to supplement uh, the response to the um, COVID-19? Um, we did have a little bit of savings, especially in the areas of some supplies, custodial supplies, so that helped us in this year's budget. Um, because when we closed the buildings, we shut them down and did not let people in. So once we made the clean, uh, cleaning, we did not have to go back and re-clean. So that was very helpful. One of the other areas that cost us a little bit of money was the fact that it gave our mechanics, the town mechanics, more time to go through our buses and do some preventative maintenance that normally is very difficult to do. So that, that worked out in the, uh, well for us. And we just received a phone call from Carver probably two weeks ago and they had another bus for sale. So we just bought another used bus for $5,000. Oh, interesting, good. Yeah, yeah. Is that a special needs bus? A regular bus. Yeah, regular. Regular bus. Yeah. yeah. Who's gonna drive it? Yeah. <laughs> no, not me. Question, sorry. Yeah. Are there any other questions relevant to uh, the past fiscal year? You also undoubtedly had savings in utilities with the school shut down. Um, some, not as much as what you would think, just because we still had people in the buildings working while we dropped the heat to our vacation winter level we didn't freeze anybody out either so we saw some savings not as much as what we had hoped okay anything else gentlemen okay, being let's move on to our curve well, i'll call it the current fiscal year because that's what we're involved in and i'd like to just read something that uh, Kimberly had sent over to, to me, this was prior to town meeting, and that was the uh, school committee approved the budget of $29,430,737. And to reach the number, they apply the following funds, it was 800,000 from the circuit breaker, 100,000 from the special ed stabilization fund, and they voted to apply the entire amount of the 507,000 $946, well, that was the approximate, of COVID-19 funds. And uh, they overrode keeping the 200,000 from the COVID-19 money for the following year and decided to apply the money to the local 
recall some employees who had been reduced. And that gave us the, the uh, number that we voted for at the annual town meeting. And the special ed money, Joyce, I think um, the step special ed stabilization, I believe your committee has to go before the selectmen. And you both have to approve the transfer of that money out. Correct. Yeah, that was at, um, let's see, the annual town meeting on October of 2017 when it was voted in. That was the stipulation mm -hmm. that was in the article. Right. So at the appropriate time, that's what we will do. Right. So is there anything in particular about the, um, the nuke? <clears throat> Did I see your hand up, Jody? No, I'm fine. Okay. Now, how much, how much of a staff reduction did you have to experience and in what areas did you experience it in? Um, initially, we cut, I believe, approximately 14 to 15 staff had it across the board. It was in areas of teachers, paraprofessionals, uh, custodians, um, administrative staff. And when it was voted to use the COVID money, we brought back some elementary teachers, one middle school teacher, and a number of paraprofessionals. When we first looked at the budget, the um, administrators agreed to a zero raise for this year, a zero increase. And we were still in negotiations with our unit A. We are, we have a tentative agreement. It has not been voted upon yet, but it looks like that there'll be another group agreeing for a zero for a number of school days and then it will go to a one percent um, that's not been ratified and then the custodians then revoted and agreed for a zero increase for this year so that certainly um, has helped us now is that definite or is it still somewhat tentative uh, for the custodians, that is a definite, definite. And so you're stable now with your uh, teaching staff? Yes. You know, at this point, we would, given the uncertainty of how we're going to return to school, the ramifications of the uh, social distancing that we're going to have to be to put into place, we are absolutely maxed in every, using every location. So even at some point, if we had money coming from the feds um, to help with staffing, I'm not sure adding teaching staff at this point is something that we can, we can do just because we have no more space. We looked at various, um, other buildings because if we would have to return at 100 percent and social distance we would be short probably about a total of um, 38 spaces i would believe if i looked completely at everything around the you know, district um, and there's just really no place in town right now that we could go and occupy to make additional classrooms. Well, even if you tried to do that, it would cost you an additional expense just to configure wherever you're going to accommodate a classroom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would. And it would also, I mean, there's also, it's a ripple effect because not only would we have to reconfigure um, the space, then we'd also have to make sure that it had internet accessibility. We'd have to have communications um, back and forth. We'd have to have additional staffing. Um, and even with some additional staffing, you know, in two of the models, we would need, we will need to, um, 
have some additional folks. If we went the face to face, I think the number was 158 additional people, which brought us to about with uh, benefits included almost a $9 million increase in the budget, which we do not have, uh, nor does the town. And even if you did, I'm not sure where I would find 158 people at this point to hire. So um, one of the benefits, which I will say, is the commissioner has said you have to have only basically desk and chairs in the room. Personal, you know, like your rocking chair or your rugs or other pieces that teachers have in their classrooms need to be removed. Now we're going to have to get some temporary storage units to take care of that. But at DECAS, here's the good piece. We're using this as a time to start clean, cleaning out. So we have a dumpster over at DECAS now that <laughs> to clean out the buildings and pitch things that need to go by the wayside. So when we do end up, you know, making the transition to the new building, we have one less thing to do. <laughs> but it sounds very much like whatever option you choose, you can't afford it anyway. Yeah. Um, well, I think that the hybrid is a model that we could work with and really it will depend upon some of the things, the pieces that the governor or the governor, the commissioner is willing to be a little bit of uh, show some flexibility. For instance, we would be looking at possibly changing the time of day that we're in school. Now, if that would happen, we could do without lunch monitors because we would be sending food home with kids. We would be able to get people in and start cleaning much earlier than we would if they waited until the end of the school day. Um, if we only have half the student body in, hopefully we can do some reassignment and some um, cohorts with teaching staff as well. That would help us cut down on subs because that certainly is a huge concern of ours, bringing anybody strange in and out of buildings. Just don't want to do it. So, you know, we're really waiting to see what comes up in the next week to week and a half from the commissioner. And then we will be presenting our plans to the school committee because they are the ones that will need to vote on how we will return to school in the fall. Well, in addition to that, uh, they also sent out, Desi sent out a requirement, what you're supposed to have on the hand in the context of masks, the sanitizers, uh, things of that nature. And in addition, um, on an earlier conversation, you mentioned you are gonna have to uh, kind of realign in your furniture as some of the tables in the classrooms are five foot and you need six foot. Um, mm -hmm they've already committed or you've already committed all these uh, CARES money that uh, you allowed until, let's see, September of 22, you had a bit that availability, but they've committed it. And all that it's left, I think, is the CARES money from Plymouth County, and that's only about 400000 And that has to be spent, I believe, by September, this September. Um, yeah, I, I will... You know, we have been extremely fortunate with the cooperation and, and the help from the town in helping secure some good prices for our PPEs. However, with that said, you know, we, I've put a freeze on any spending at this point to buy school supplies, you know, back to school supplies like we would normally buy, um, just because I don't know where I'm at with how much longer the we'll be able to um, work with the town to get our supplies because I assume at some point money will run out. And when that happens, you know, for instance, we've, according to the formula that we have to go by, a three month supply of mask, if I was going to have people on a consistent basis in the buildings, I would have to have 202,000 masks. 
um, I need 183 gallons of hand sanitizer, et cetera, et cetera. And the list just goes on and on. You know, and as we start having conversations with staff, you know, I have some students that at times there needs to be physical restraints. Well, if that's going to happen, I need to make sure my staff are in protective gear so that we're now looking for some suits that somebody can jump in fairly quickly if we need to do a physical restraint. You know, we have face masks, um, all kinds of sanitizer, pieces like that that we've been trying to order and keep, keep because I, I don't know how much longer it's going to be available either because that's some of the problems that we ran into this spring is getting availability. Some of the regulations that uh, were sent out uh, from DESE uh, today or yesterday, I think it was, with respect to if you have a, a student that shows up who has sniffles or uh, things of that nature, would that require extra staffing for you to A, to accommodate them, but B, you have to have uh, extra rooms available, et cetera? Mm -hmm. Right. We have to have um, an isolation room. So if a staff person is, or a student is ill, that's where they go um, so we can kind of contain any uh, possible virus spread if the student or staff has a virus. The problem would be if the student is already in school or the staff person is in school and then is diagnosed, we then have to have staff that will clean the areas, um, start the tracing, and notification and so yeah there is a lot and there will be a cost associated with well you have to have an extra staff member on the buses as a monitor mm -hmm. yeah that's one of the uh pieces that desi is going to release today that they highly advise having a monitor on the bus we we do have some monitors right now we do not have enough monitors for every bus. Um, we've tried to find monitors in the past and we've not been able to, uh, that's a rolling, rolling open application. It sounds very much like, I mean, you've bought, brought personnel back using the uh, CARES money, but then the, that CARES money would have been spent for for the uh, expenses that you're going to encounter just to meet the requirements or the guidelines as they call them from DESI. Um, yes, you know, and another piece that I don't think back when we were looking at this budget, it really dawned on us the implication, but students also have to have their individual supplies. We cannot, you know, in the past you would have a bucket of crayons or clay or, you know, things that people would share. That cannot take place any longer. So if a teacher wants to have students have supplies, it's all going to be individualized. Not only do we have to have individual pieces, we also have to have something that can hold them and keep them separate from everybody else's. And then we have to have some way to spray it down or sanitize it at the end of the day. Having to purchase, um, you know, in fact, our, our staff's right now back at the table having discussion about what do they actually need to put in kids' hands to make it work. Anyone have any comment or questions they want to add? <clears throat> yeah. Um, is the elementary school going to go every day, middle school every day, high school every day? We don't know. Yeah, probably not at first. Um, I have a survey out now with parents and one to parents and guardians and then a separate one to staff. When you look at the survey from our staff, certainly a high percentage is leaning toward um, remote to begin with and then gradually phase it in would be our 
our preference um, at some point. The parents are really split. Um, it's going to be a very difficult decision for the school committee to make. And like many other decisions that we have to make, um, there's no, you will not make everyone happy. <laughs> now, how about your food services, your delivery of the food to the uh, classrooms, I think now is that's going to, going to change? Yes, it, um, it will change. And one of the things that we're really looking at is, is there a way to send the food home with students so we do not have students eating in the buildings? For a couple of reasons. At the high school and at the middle school, they said they could be three feet apart as long as they had mask on. To eat, of course, you can't have your mask on and you would have to move to six feet apart. However, they don't want rooms cross-contamination cross occurring. So if I have a room and I have every student three feet apart, when it comes time for lunch, because you're not eating lunch in the cafeteria, I have to figure, well, somebody has to figure out where will half the students go to have lunch. You then, what about everybody else that would be eating lunch at that time? Where are we going to put everyone? Um, we also need to give teachers lunch time, our paraprofessionals, so we would be looking at hiring additional monitors. If we are able to make some adjustments in the school day and the school time, one of our thoughts and what we're exploring is how could we send home breakfast in the morning with students and lunch in the afternoon. So if a student, let's just say, went five days a week, on that fifth day, we would send home enough meals for the next five days or because that's when they're going to be at home with remote because there'll be another group coming in. And if we're able to do that, then we've eliminated the cost of having to have monitors, having to have people deliver food to the um, rooms and having to hire additional staff to clean up. So we're trying to figure out a way to make it work. We've had food, a breakfast in the classroom for a number of years. It's not, it's doable, but I cannot imagine the amount of trash and um, cleanup that if we doubled that and had lunch as well. So your, your plan is to send breakfast home for the following day then, so that children would have breakfast at home even though it's supplied by the school and not have it at the classroom in the classroom. Right. Yes. We're looking at that. You know, one of the other pieces though, that we have to uh, consider because it's always a ripple effect, right? You know, if I, you know, when I would get something to eat and I was a kid, boy, I couldn't wait to open that and start eating it. And if I'm busing students on the bus, I can't have students eating on the bus. So we're gonna to have to come up with some kind of a mechanism for our bus riders that as they exit the bus, they get handed their food. And it's just, you know, one more step. Mm -hmm. no matter how much What's the probability that if a, if a child goes home with five meals on Friday, and those and the meals have to last five days. That they will actually last five days. Yeah, it's probably slim to none. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, there's just not a real good solution right now. We've we've kind of toyed around with seeing if we could still shuttle food out to students that are being remote. We're just not quite sure how we could hit everybody. So those are just some of the, those are things that we're still looking at. We need to make sure our kids get enough food um, and have have meals. Yeah, 
Kim, as you describe what you have to accomplish, it sounds like there is a cost of material for one, but very definitely you're going to have to have additional personnel. I assume everybody that's currently, say, in the budget has a job to do. There's no one just hanging around that can uh, take on extra responsibilities and still accomplish because they're short, you're shorthanded already. Um, so I have a concern that there's going to be extra needs and I'm not sure what the feds are going to do. But I think that's where the money may be coming from, if at all. So I suggest you have a, you know, the, the past decisions, irrespective of what they were, weren't necessarily bad decisions. But unfortunately, uh, things are changing so rapidly and within weeks, you just never know what you're going to need down the road. And you've got a plan today but tomorrow is going to be different. Well, there's no question there are going to be extra costs. I mean, it's inconceivable there won't be. What is the process the town's going to follow or the school committee is going to follow to either get those monies, not spend those money? What's going to happen? Well, essentially, we won't know what uh, was on our cherry sheet how much it may or may not change until October when the legislature decides to uh, accept their own budget. And that'll give us the revised figures. Now, we're not sure, excuse me, my cat prefers my lap. We're not sure what they may do. If we have to go in and let's say we will get less revenue than we anticipated, the school department, as far as that uh, line item that I read, that is their budget. We cannot reduce their budget. They are in action. They're in, uh, I can't think of the word I want to use now, but they're in place. They're operating. So we can't reduce their budget. Everything's going to be adjusted probably on the municipal side at best. And that's not good for anyone. Hopefully uh, they'll find something somewhere and uh, 10% will be, won't be too much less than we anticipated. But unfortunately, even uh, now, uh, Alan Slavin, who's the director on MMA, they don't have much of an, opportunity, of an optimistic viewpoint as to what may change in the budget. I'm a director on the uh, Association of Town Finance Committees. We also do not have a good idea what's going on. Uh, everything's happening up in the, the uh, State House, but it's happening behind closed doors. So we're all in the dark, so to speak. So, so if I understand what you're saying, Bernie, if the state gives us less money than we're anticipating, and the cost of the schools are higher than we're anticipating, it's going to come out of the municipal side? It's well, out of the finance committee. The... Uh, I couldn't say where the money's going to come from one way or the other or what the impact will be. Obviously, if we don't have as much money as we anticipated, we're going to have to reduce further. There's just no way, other way. Uh, the implications, if we took it out of the stabilization fund, yes, we could take the money out, but it could cost us monies in the long run because then our um, bond rating may change, so our interest rates would go up, so we'd be paying more in interest than when we borrow the money, so we pay it there. What we would save on it, we pay it elsewhere. Uh, free cash, that isn't that great this year, um, but it's going to be there and to use that as operational as we know, um, we do that with our own peril because it's not, re it's, uh, not uh, repeating from year to year. So Kim is trying very difficult, uh, with great difficulty to meet the guidelines, we are going to have great difficulty in meeting our own appropriations that we've done thus far. So uh, if uh, it's only cost a couple bucks, but by all means go out, buy some lottery tickets and make us the down the beneficiary in your will. Wait a minute, that's a two-step process there. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that's not our best option. <laughs> 
Any other questions? Yes, Jody. Uh, and I want to just thank the superintendent for being here. I do appreciate it. And I have one comment I want to make and a question. You brought up a lot of points that I never gave a thought about what you have to do to get the schools open. For example, the separate crayons and things like that. I mean, there's a, there's a lot more to this than I ever anticipated. And, and my question is, as far as the teachers go, how many were actually, I'm sure you had some retirements, but how many teachers were actually lost, you know, that they were furloughed, laid off, however you want to word it? Uh, were there any positions? Yes. Yes. We uh, had several teachers that had retired and one teacher that had resigned because she was moving out of state and we did not replace those positions. We also have had a number of teachers who we've not, who we did reduce and we've not called back. So when all is said and done, I would say, you know, not looking at my notes, approximately eight to 10. Hmm. Thank you. Hmm. Any other questions or comments? Don't we have to punch up a lot of what if costs and just so we know what the heck it's going to cost if whatever the course you take. We just can't sit here and say we're going to spend more money without knowing what it's going to be. We ought to be able to project it because you've got several options. Well, I think Kim is dealing with, uh, and I won't speak for her, but what I know of, a number of things have come out from DESE in the last two weeks, and there's one more, which would be the busing, which you anticipated today, and that all will impact the budget for the schools department considerably. And it's very, it's very difficult when you don't know what DESE is going to, DESE is going to uh, lay out as a guideline to estimate the cost. But I'm, I'm certain the superintendent will have that well in hand in a week or two, because she has to open her door sooner or later. Mm -hmm. Hopefully we'll get a business manager for you too, Kim. Yeah, that would be nice. <laughs> but yes, Tom, um, unfortunately the, uh, the requirements or guidelines that Desi has handed down only came within the past week or two. And I would even say with that, there's still so much flexibility and uncertainty when you listen to some of the um, comments and the, and the um, questions that are being asked of Jesse. And it basically, the decision is going to come down to local control. So what we're trying to do right now is we have, um, I can't even, probably a hundred, <laughs> that we're meeting with to look at all the scenarios and everything that we possibly need to open. And what we're doing is putting together plans, having workshops with the committee, sharing that information um, because we need them to be very well informed when we get ready to make that, when they get ready to vote. One of the things that we certainly are looking at is delaying the opening of school for students um, for many different reasons. And we're looking at certain groups of students that we know need to be in as much as we can possibly get them in. We hope to have that flushed out even greater in the next week or so. So I'd be happy to come back and have that a further discussion with you once we know what we're doing um, and possible cost if that would be helpful yes yeah, so you much appreciate it kim mm -hmm. any a, other questions or concerns gentlemen yes jody just a comment you know you watch the news and the federal government seems like they change what they're going to give or where they're going to give the money from one stimulus package to the next but it's tough to be optimistic that there's going to be more money coming from them. I would like to think there will be, and there should be, you know, to the towns and the schools. But, you know, 
I don't think they appreciate that the schools can't just pick this up September 1st and just go full speed ahead. You know, I mean, I, I just don't know how they think that people can plan. I mean, it, it, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of work that goes into opening schools in a regular year. Never mind this year, and they just seem to kind of delay things. And I'm just watching what's on the news. I don't know. I can't speak for the superintendent how frustrating it is on her end, you know, listening to these people. It's just mind-boggling. There's a lot of different realities out there. Yeah. Anything else, gentlemen? No, one other issue I wanted to bring up, and principally because as soon as the school committee and the superintendent uh, opens the door of the school, they have to go about now preparing for the next budget of FY22. And that'll be the time frame in which the new school is projected open. As a matter of fact, uh, the contractual turnover date is October 15th. That means for two and a half months, they'll be running or be obligated to pay for all the expenses, heat, light, et cetera, for two and a half months while simultaneously still run Vegas and Minot. And I just wanted to make sure everyone's aware of that possibility. And in the FY22 budget, that they're gonna to have to accommodate that. In addition, uh, I can project that, uh, I know Kim wants to get rid of it as quickly as possible, but uh, Degas will still be running at least for a month, month and a half until uh, she's able to clean it off and then pass it on to the uh, back to the selectmen. So the, her budget, uh, I think, and that with the school committee is going to have to consider during that time period is running an extra that huge building for two and a half months empty and then move her to students in on I believe January second is uh, when it's projected to actually have that uh, building go live. What's your best guess? What kind of money you think you're looking at? Just a guess. A couple hundred thousand, millions? Really? <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> it's a rough guesstimate based on what they see in the budgets right now. And what I've asked for projections from Ch Chad is um, it could go up around 150 to 200,000. Because he, uh, as I say with the leads, just the heat and light uh, is projected based on the uh, estimates we received during the um, process we've gone through with the building committee is around a 10 to 12,000 a month to start out with. That's just for the heat and light. Yeah, and you know, and that was one thing that in every budget since we committed to make this a reality for our students, I've really tried to guard certain line items in the budget and put money there because, I, you know, in education, once you give something up, it's very hard to get it back. Mm -hmm. um, so right now in the heating lines, when I would look at combining the two, I have a $108,000 between what we have for mine it and what I have for Dekas. And then I have another 105,000 in utilities. Um, we have some maintenance of contracts and maintenance of equipment money in both. It's my hope that I'm not looking at any repairs in a new building. So some of that <laughs> money could stay in that line item but could be pulled over if needed to be in utilities um, and i think that's something that everybody's going to have to make a very conscious effort in this budget to make sure that we've put those lines in and we've kept them in and we've not reduced it yeah my concern is only that you're going to be running these buildings simultaneously for three four months and that's unfortunate uh, but it's just the way the time is concerned because once they turn it over to uh, the selectmen, the selectmen will in turn uh, give care and custody over to the uh, school department so that they, you can begin moving in and doing everything you need to do. But I'm sure we'll work it out, but I just wanted everybody aware uh, since about the, uh, well, five months, 
January is when the school committee has to submit their FY22 budget, that these are similar issues that, again, on top of what may be the uh, COVID-19 situation, we don't know when that's going to happen or when it's going to come to an end. And which, by the way, Kim, um, I know you, you've got an awful lot on your plate already, but you might give some consideration to the furniture that's being ordered for the new building. Mm. It will um, accommodate or cope with or co agree with uh, the restrictions you have with the COVID-19. Yes, in fact, we had a, I met with Susan Taylor and had a conversation about some designs um, when this all started and just said, look, is there any way that we can make some different configurations uh, to any spaces to accommodate something like this happening, if it would happen in the future? So we're looking a little bit at that and certainly we'll look at the furniture because we cannot lock ourselves in or lock the future um, employees of, of Wareham into tables of five feet when you need six feet or et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, it would be nice if we could uh, pre-order some furniture and some six foot tables that you could use now and <laughs> move over. Would, yeah. We'll talk to chat about that and see what the MSBA will do. I'm sure they'll just jump right over. <laughs> okay, are there any further questions of uh, Kim or Joyce? For being none, Kim, uh, Joyce, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you for your hey, time, Elsie. your help. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to some other issues that we have. Um, some approval of some outstanding minutes. We have March 11th, 13th, 21st, 28th, and June 4th. Uh, have you had an opportunity to uh, print them out or look at them or anything, gentlemen? I have. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll take a motion on uh, each, if I may. The um, may I have a motion to approve March 11. So moved. Second. And Jody and David. Any questions or concerns for changes? Being none, all those in favor say aye. 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 It's approved. Uh, no abstentions. Uh, March 13. So moved. May I have a second? Second. Motion's made and seconded. Any changes? There being none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Pardon? Okay. March 21st. I have a motion to approve. So moved. Motion's made, seconded by Stewart. Any changes? There being none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The vote. March 28th. So moved. May I have a second? Second. Stuart, second. Any changes? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The vote. June 4th. So moved. Motion to approve. May I have a second? Second. Motion being seconded. All those in favor say aye. Aye. No opposition. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, in our liaison reports, David, uh, you and I talked this afternoon and you have had a uh, meeting with the police department. Could you give us some idea how that went, please? Uh, yes. We're, the Public Safety Building Committee has been meeting and is looking to try to get a proposal put together early next year. Uh, what we're doing right now is we're trying to identify and I hate to use the term, but recruit 
any other organizations within the community that might want to participate in that. So obviously the police are there, we have the EMTs who are interested. Uh, we're talking with the fire departments. Um, we're also looking at uh, the environmental people. We've had uh, Dave Menard, he was at our last meeting and said, although we'd like to participate, he does not need any additional space. But he did mention that we do need space for a emergency operations center. Uh, we do not have a facility in town that's appropriate for emergency operations, storms, hurricanes, um, and so on. So he be, would be interested in working on us, working with us on that. Um, and obviously our utility companies would also be interested in working on that. So we're going to be soliciting to find out if any, if we can get some assistance from the utility companies. The electric companies historically have participated in emergency operation centers and helped to set them up. In addition, we're looking at perhaps working with the county sheriff's office. Maybe we, the police obviously do a lot of work with the sheriff's department and um, are hoping that you know, they can work some, some sort of an agreement out with them. Uh, Chief Walchek is, has some contacts in both the state and federal law enforcement agencies and he's inquiring to find out if there's any interest there. So again, the more organizations that can be included in this, uh, the better chances of getting additional funding from state and federal sources. If it's just a police station, you're rather limited. If it's a uh, public safety complex, there are more opportunities to get funding. Now, as part of the overall effort to make sure that everybody has been involved, and Claire has been very active in this, and she knows a lot about what's going on in town, the prime location we're looking at right now is the one that was recommended back in 2007, which is a 25 plus or minus acre parcel of property that's located on Minot Avenue, just to the east of the existing, the new school. It's about two parcels down. Um, and Claire asked that the water pollution control facility tell us if they have any interest in the property. And it turns out that they may. They are looking at ground discharge sites right now where they've reached the maximum they can put into the Agawam River, which is less than the maximum output of a plant. So they've hired a consultant to look at various locations around the town-owned property around the water pollution control facility. And one of those is the Minot forest parcel. Uh, their use would be somewhere around five to 10 acres, which would leave the public safety complex anywhere from 20 to 15 acres, which is really going to be sufficient, we believe, for any use. So we, it could be a, a shared use. And uh, in the next several weeks, several members of the Public Safety uh, Building Complex Committee are going to see if we can get uh, representatives from the fire department to go look at some combined facilities. A number of combined facilities are available around the state. One that they particularly like is in situate. And uh, so if we can develop some interest with the Prudential Committee and the, the fire chiefs. Um, maybe there'll be some combined usage and maybe even some savings in things such as the dispatchers and other facilities. That's where we stand right now. David, has EMS made any comment? I know their, their concern was response times from locations. Right. 
uh, they have um, they're, they're rather limited as to what their response time, I believe their response time is required to be something like seven minutes throughout the community. And so they're concerned about moving any further away from the West Wareham area and the area down towards Marion than they are right now. So that's something that they're looking at and perhaps they'll end up with a, uh, a central area and perhaps even a, a, a satellite. So they are looking at that. Any questions for David, gentlemen? Jody? Just hope, I hope people understand too when they're looking at this stuff that response time can impact your home insurance. Yes. So I, I mean, I, I'm sure they know that and you, you know that, but a lot of people don't realize that it's just not that simple. It could town-wide impact people's insurance. Right. And the other thing I want to mention, and this is something my wife's firm on this, is a public safety building having the police and fire together. And I understand all the other units, but with, with COVID, social distancing, having everybody in the same building, if you ever had to go through the whole building, it, it could be an issue. It could be an issue. And, there and the other part of that is, and I hate to say this in this day and age with terrorism and everything else that's going on, do you want, and I just read this on somewhere today, you want to put all your eggs in one basket. You know, that, that is a consideration, you know, things like that, as much as I hate to say it, but it's just the way of the world. Right. I, two I items. Have discuss that stuff. No, two items on that. Number one, the Minot Forest location is really in the, geo, very close to the geographic center of Wareham. I think it's a great location. So geographically, it's, it's very good. And the other thing is that although there would be some shared facilities, uh, the and particularly in Wareham, where the fire department is a separate entity than the town, uh, there would be separation between the two, two facilities. They also, as the fire department now has satellite garages, they would maintain, continue to have some satellite garages. I think Carver, their new station is a combination police and fire. And when um, I toured it, there was a physical barrier between the two of them. Obviously there were doors between the buildings, but essentially there were two separate buildings that shared a common wall because their, their purposes are so different than each other that they wouldn't interfere with each other. Right. Yeah, it, yeah but, and I understand all that, I get all that, but sometimes just guys out in the parking lot, where are you going to dinner tonight? Things like that, you know, it's just a natural, majority of where I live in town, so it's just kind of a, you know, I don't think it's a big issue. My wife did it happen when it's from where we moved from that that's what they want to put up for. She just thinks it's a rotten idea. Uh, for the for the reasons I, 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 I think there's you know, I, you know, we don't agree on anything, but there can be arguments made for both ways. I mean it's it's oh yeah just, guys naturally gab, yeah, you know, but uh that's all. You say gals naturally gab? No, you say guys. Gals. I say guys, don't <laughs> But yeah, it's just a natural thing out the back of the line, you know, like, it, you know, it just, things happen, you know, it's, this whole COVID thing has just put a whole new light on. Oh, absolutely. You know, it, it's it, like the superintendent said, you got to kind of plan for down the road. God forbid we ever get another one of these, but who knows? Yeah, that's true. Very true. No. Any other questions of David? Thank you. Thank you, David. Anything else? Um, Last night, uh, I was on a, a Zoom call, of which there are many, and it was with David, Richard Swenson. And he is working with the planning board, and they are advocating changing the zoning for what they called W1, which is Merchant's Way and Main Street, right in the center of Wareham. And they're considering changing the zoning requirements to allow uh, mixed use development. Uh, Parpin's business as well as uh, commercial and utilizing Merchant's Way. Now Merchant's Way, uh, unbeknownst to a lot of people, is not a street. 
it's town-owned property used as parking and it butts up to the back of all those buildings to the railroad track and by changing the zoning they hope to stimulate some uh, other businesses to come in there and actually build a deck over or allowed to build a deck that would be air rights over Merchants Way, let's say in the back of their business uh, currently, and uh, have restaurant as further uh, enlarge the building. So in the footprint of the building goes beyond the actual borders of their property and extends into the air rights of which uh, we would give them probably a 99 year lease on the air rights above Merchants Way. That would allow them to be parking underneath as well as the zoning would allow them to put parking underneath the building. It would be in the floodplain area, so that would be uh, not um, relevant to their actual construction of what they put into the building. It's interesting. It's an interesting concept. It kind of uh, dovetails into what they intend to do with the uh, railroad station. They've got a $41,000 grant and they're going to rehab it and turn it into what they hope will be a small uh, sandwich shop or the like. It does have toilet facilities and a utility closet inside already. So that's uh, not something they have to uh, add on, <clears throat> put out some uh, cafe tables and the like, and uh, try to make it a, a, <clears throat> a go-to place or a conversational place you can stop and have a sandwich and watch the swans on one side of you and the deteriorating building on the other. <clears throat> oh. <laughs> that would be that green building that's been condemned and the selectmen have uh, created a group of, um, I think it's the building committee, the uh, inspector, Rich Bowen, counselor, and that's the third person, I don't know who it is now, and they are pursuing the owner since the building has been condemned and has taken no action in tearing it down. And so they are pursuing legal action. There are two other buildings within the community that are in the same situation and they're gonna pursue legal rights to uh, think, uh, tear it down and charge the uh, owner for the cost of doing so. But uh, the W1 change in zoning, I think I sent you copies um, of the email which contains the links and uh, pages, I think there are about 28, 30 pages in each one, and there's three different uh, versions, excuse me, three different reports uh, that uh, the possible zoning changes. And this is still up in the air. This is in further discussion. And Richard Swenson is leading the charge on this one also, as he did with the uh, Redevelopment Authority. Hopefully this dovetails in with what Redevelopment wanted to do with the other side of the tracks in developing a promenade coming down from uh, from on nail all the way down through paralleling uh, Merchant's Way. So at your leisure, by all means, read it. It's very stimulating, I'm sure. I haven't, <laughs> as the use reports usually are. But uh, we, in the meeting we had uh, about six of us because he's trying to meet with all the uh, chairman of the various committees. And uh, Eugene, who is uh, Historical Commission, Historical Society, and uh, she was advocating, of course, that we retain, retain the appearance of Wareham and Wareham um, Main Street in with small buildings versus one huge building, apartment building or whatever, something of that nature. So I think it's, um, it's it sounds like a good idea, a good future idea, and something we can start to build on for the uh, center of town, Wareham Center. And uh, it's, it's, we're fortunate to have Richard around that he's we're willing to carry the water on this thing. And so I certainly uh, compliment on his efforts. And the planning board is being uh, very, very proactive with those people. And uh, that's about it on that. And there's another, I think, Zoom meeting. I'll keep you posted on it. Also, uh, the planning board has a number of changes they want to make to the zoning and they've invited us on August 17th to a joint meeting similar to the one we had uh, last year. <clears throat> I think by having a joint meeting with the planning board, we certainly can eavesdrop on a lot of conversations that, may, that they'll have that uh, will go into greater detail 
than we may be aware of to ask questions on when we have our own hearing. So if uh, there's no objections, I'll plan uh, accepting Ken's invitation. It's August 17th. I'm not sure if it'll be a Zoom. Um, right now, the largest group that we've had, the, ability, the rooms configured for would be the uh, selectmen and school committee, which is about five people. And that's spread around their table and they've got uh, plexiglass shields up. A group such as ours with nine and then uh, five more planning engineer plus Ken uh, would probably be end up being a Zoom. Any questions so far? Good, we have uh, something. Kelly, our secretary, is retiring and she's been doing the um, finance committee for, I think she's at about 20 plus years. And uh, her reason for retiring is personal. Uh, <clears throat> and I haven't had any information with respect to a replacement uh, for her. It's uh, billed through the uh, planning department. And she's, because the committee, the, uh, Conservation Commission is part of that department. The expenses line item that shows up in our budget is primarily for our printing and it's not for any of her labor costs that she puts in. And she does it primarily from uh, in home, uh, usually because she'll uh, come to our meeting in the evening and then during the day she'll type up our minutes and anything like that. Like when she works on the um, our town report, she typically does a lot of that at home from her own computer, it's more com comfortable for her. But uh, I've spoken to Derek and he's aware of it and I'm not sure how they're gonna handle it and I have no information with respect to a replacement. Um, as email come up with many of you, I thank you for uh, wanting to share to give her some kind of uh, recognition for what she's done for us as well as for the finance committee over the many years. Uh, Dave and I have discussed it and we've, uh, there's of course flowers and there's a um, gift certificate to a restaurant, of course it's nice, but um, David has suggested something something more memorable that will give her, uh, every time she, she came in the house and looked on the shelf, there'd be something commemorative of all the effort she put in for 20 years on the finance committee. And I like that idea, uh, it's just it's difficult, difficult to come up with what it could be. And so, Collectively, I'm charging everyone put their our heads together and some come up with some suggestions. I'd love to hear them, and I don't care how much it costs. I said it's well. She's well worth it. She's made us look very, very good. And then uh, what else we got? Let's see. We have the reorg. Yes, I'm. <laughs> It is our time. I've finally uh, been advised that I've been reappointed to the committee for my last three year stint. Yeah, it was up in the air because we, <laughs> we didn't have enough people in the uh, appointing committee show up. Oh. <laughs> so, um, on the reorganization, uh, let's see. Uh, I would like to make a recommendation. Wait a minute, Jerry's around. Hey, Jerry, you still up and running? Here. You still there? Okay, you're the clerk. So I'm going to appoint you. Appoint, you're the clerk. So you'll have to run the reorganization. So we'll go. Yeah, so the first one will be chairman, then we'll go to vice chairman, and then we'll go to uh, clerk. Okay. I nominate the present no, chairman. No, excuse me, why don't you ask? Ask for nominations. You're ch you're in charge, so you can make the nomination. Can I have a nomination for the chairman from uh, anyone? Any. I second that motion. Okay, a nomination for Bernie. Any anyone else? Okay, you have a vote on it. Uh, Jody. Yes. Stewart. David. Yes. Glenn. Yes. Tom. Yes. Myself. Yes. Bernie. I vote for myself. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Seven zero zero. Bernie, you're in. Good. 
All right, can I have a nomination for vice chair? David. I, I nominate Jerry. David, can we have a second for David? No, I would. <laughs> Stewart. We also have a nomination for, for uh, Jerry. Well, I'm, I'm clerk. I, I'm, I'm happy with that. <laughs> so, can we have a vote for David? Jody? Yes. Glenn? Yes. Dave? Yes. Stuart? Huh? Yes. Myself? Yes. You got it, Dave. Dave. <laughs> I'll swap. <laughs> we have a nomination for clerk. I'll nominate Jerry. Thanks, Jerry. <laughs> <Stuart Stacey. laughs> I'll you second. You really don't need a second. You're in. <laughs> okay, on the votes for, for Jerry for clerk. Jo Jody. Yes. Stewart. Yes. Glenn. Yes. David. Yes. Tom. Yes. Jerry's a clerk. See, that was a big upheaval. <laughs> yeah, something's working. Thank you very much. Okay, our next meeting will be August 17th. I will keep you posted as to the time. And as I said, it's probably going to be a Zoom meeting. And by all means, um, please, uh, Send me your suggestions possibly for something for, to notif notification for Kelly. And anything else, gentlemen? I got one quick question being nosy. Yes, Jody. I see the CBC has put a $150,000 article in. What's that for? CPC? Yeah. I am not aware of it. They've talked about it as such. It's, I mean, they, they they talked about before. I didn't realize they were going to talk about anything before last night's selectmen's meeting. Then they went into executive session, and something's coming. I was just curious what it was. That's all. Oh, you mean the selectmen? Yeah. Well. Okay. When you said the CBC and putting the article in. Yeah. Okay. I'll find out about it that then. Well, it's it's going to come up eventually. I was just curious. Okay. And one of the things that uh, David and I have discussed, as far as the liaison. We always go through this process of hopefully uh, assigning each person something. And we were discussing, David and I, and I thought, uh, I suggested, why don't we try groups, two or three of you as a group, be responsible for part of the government. As an example, uh, general government, which is the first group we usually go together, go on with um, town meeting as the article in, within it. And two or three of you will be assigned that, that way it's, not a burden to any one particular, and you can take turns running or watching any particular um, committee that's being televised, et cetera, things of that nature. So we'll get that to you in uh, short order. And there being nothing else, was everybody satisfied with um, what we got from the school department? You got a big job. Yeah. Yeah, they got a big job and there's just so many unknowns. It's it's scary. Yes. So, so they know what they have to spend. Their hands are somewhat tight. Right. Well, they don't know what they have to spend, but they don't even know what they have to spend it on. Indeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's... And there's, they're uh, currently doing interviews for a business manager. And I had been invited to be part of the interview committee. And we've interviewed two people and we're very disappointed. They were, uh, they were in some ways very knowledgeable. They're very unprofessional in their presentation at all. And as a group, the five of us were all in, in agreement that uh, they were just not appealing. And they weren't familiar with the system we have, which is the VADAR. It unfortunately is an old system. Um, and so Kim is going to uh, reevaluate the other applications that she received and uh, see if there's a couple of them. If not, they'll have to repost. Now, the, um, unfortunately, the business manager's office is also shorthanded. Not only did they discharge the business manager, but I think there were two others in the department they had to let go or discharge. And so, mm -hmm. as Kim says, <laughs> she spends up a lot of late nights just figuring that part out. 
let alone how it's going to operate. And she's very fortunate having some very, very um, dedicated staff members. And I watch them sometimes because I go by the Degas school, the bus pulls up and they make sure the sandwiches are there in front of uh, the middle school. They got another group going there. There's eight locations around town and they're doing a terrific job. And uh, I think David can, through his, your daughter, David Jen, can testify how difficult it has become to uh, ha handle the special needs students during this process. Oh, definitely. So I, I hand it to him, you know, we sometimes uh, go a little competitively between uh, school and municipal side and all, but I have to hand them to them. They're doing an outstanding job with the burden they have to carry. Is an entertain a motion to adjourn. So me. Anybody want to second it? Second. <laughs> All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you very much, gentlemen. Have a good evening. Yeah, stay safe, stay healthy. We'll do our best. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you indeed.